thrilled to have everyone join us today, this Monday, as we talk about building relationships in your Latinx community with Alnerez Venegas. And we practiced uh, your pronunciation. And again, I give you full invitation to please correct myself as well as Julia. If at any time we mispronounce your name, we certainly want to respect you, your culture and your name. So we are thrilled to have you with us um, and excited to dive into this conversation. Again, the theme or the topic for today's episode is building Latinx relationships in your community. So we're going to get into that here shortly. But before we do, Every episode, we start by saying thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our presenting sponsors. You can see them right in front of you on the screen. And just like I say every episode, go find them online. They're easy to find. They're doing amazing work to help you continue to do your amazing work. So they're here to support us, our episodes, our guests that we are able to attract to come on and talk about the nonprofit landscape. But they are really here and exist for one main purpose, and it is to support you and to help you continue to do good in your communities. So thank you to our sponsors. And thank you to Julia Patrick for having this wonderful idea. Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and I get to be her lucky friend slash colleague that gets to show up every day and be of service right alongside you. I'm Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And now we are back to you and we are just yeah. thrilled to have you, Alnerez, share with us about building relationships in your Latinx community. And I have a confession mm -hmm. that I found you on Instagram, right? Like I was really intentional on finding diverse voices, diverse conversations, diverse topics to talk about. Um, and so I reached out to you and I was excited to see your platform there on Instagram. So if you have not found um, this, you know, lovely woman here in your community, on Instagram, I would love for you to share us again what your handle is so that everyone can follow you there. Yes, thank you. I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Um, my handle is I work uh, nonprofit. So you can find me on Instagram there or at um, iworknonprofit.com. Uh, thank I love you. It. I love it. Okay. Um, a lot of us are understanding that this demographic is transforming our country in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And let's back up a little bit and explain, is it, I, it's Latinx or Latinx? Number one, I want to get that clear. But I think a lot of people who pr are primary English speakers don't understand the concept of the masculine and feminine um, structure to language. And so how Latinx, and again, or is it Latinx, how that is moving this this understanding even further of this demographic so before we really dig into building those relationships could you kind of give us mm -hmm. that, that framework yes um so uh, for from my understanding um the latinx basically encompasses both um the male and um female um, latino community and it's basically just to make it more um, kind of politically uh, correct in the in the um, in the community. So I mean, it you could use Latina, you can use Latina, uh, but Latinx is just a kind of more uh, formal way of um, uh, you know speaking about the individuals within um, that actual population. Right, right, and not in a gender specific manner. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because now we have all these gender pronouns and yeah. we want to be respectful. We don't know, right? And so I think it's a it's a good way to just kind of make sure that you're not, um, you know, uh, assuming that someone is either um, male or female, but that it, everyone is in one one kind of category. Yeah, I think it's really cool. I Even though I still get Mr. Jarrett Ransom letters. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, yeah, I mean, it's hard. And I think it's part of a conversation that we're having across many parts of the nonprofit um, sector when we're communicating with constituents, donors, our own teams. Um, so thank you for kind of framing that up for us. Now you have, I think we're gonna talk about five different things mm -hmm. um, to help build community, to help build relationships, I should say. Number one, you talk about building trust. I mean, yeah. I feel like we could spend a thousand hours on this topic. So I can't wait to hear what you what you have to say. 
Yes. So I think that it's important to note that um, if you're a nonprofit organization that's trying to reach out to the Latinx community, um, trust is going to be very key um, in, in, in that uh, population. And I'll just say, um, in order to build trust, there are like three things that I think for me um, as an uh, individual who has worked with the Latinx community very closely and currently does um, in order to build that trust. And I think the, the first thing would be for a nonprofit to really show up. And what I mean by that is to gather in spaces in places where the La Latino community um, is. And so I think that for me um, is key because if, uh, if the Latinx community can associate um, a face with the, the nonprofit organization, then they're more likely to utilize the services. Um, the second thing that I think would be um, key is communication. So how you communicate um, to the Latinx community. I think that they're not just individuals, they are, they're always part of a family structure. And so it's important to note that when you're dealing or you're interacting with them to really acknowledge um, everyone who's around them as a whole, instead of them as an individual uh, person. And then I think um, the last thing in terms of building trust would be um, to really just spend the time listening to them, like listening to their needs and what they, um, want before developing programs and services that you think might benefit that community. And so I think that it's just a threefold kind of approach to building that trust. I mean, there's obviously more, but I think if, if a nonprofit can kind of focus on those three, uh, excuse me, those three things, I think that would be um, key to reaching out. Wow. Even what you said, and we, we're, you know, we're only seven minutes in has just been fascinating. And I recall sharing with you on the phone, I was working at a food bank here in my local community and the program actually created, you know, like a recipe book for the boxes that were going out into the Hispanic communities. Mm -hmm. And we were getting feedback from the recipient saying, no, we didn't make this recipe. That's not something that we eat. It's not something that we're familiar cooking. And so really when you say this action number one is develop trust, it's really understanding the needs of the community. Yeah. And I love that you said, you know, the family, because we, Julia, talk so often here on the show about multi-generational giving, multi-generational attraction. Like how do we build these relationships? And the Latinx community is like, the perfect example for this expression and yeah. how we can learn so much of this and a little bit of me being jealous because I'm like, <laughs> man, <laughs> it looks so amazing. The community, the support, the family yeah. camaraderie, you know, um, so building trust first and foremost, it is so imperative. And that's exactly why we wanted to make it number one on this episode um, in conversation for you. So thank you for hitting that hard fast and uh, just right on point. So then moving forward, hello, this seems like so <laughs> basic. But, but it isn't. Not. <laughs> it's not, it's, right. It's like a mind blower. I mean, Jared, I love your um, sharing that piece about, you know, the recipes for a food box. Imagine what good is a recipe if it's not in the appropriate language. Right. And even just measurements, mm -hmm. because think about recipes come in, you know, the U S standard is a different measurement system than maybe somebody that's coming up through like Absolutely. in our community, central Latin America. Yes. It's, it's not going to work. So using Spanish, Spanish language materials, programs, and services, Talk to us about that because it's not as easy as just doing Google Translate. No, it, it isn't. Um, and I've worked with many organizations that actually um, serve the community, the Latinx community, but fail in, in this aspect. And I think it's one thing that you definitely have to put in the forefront, especially when you're talking about building trust. Because can, can you imagine going to a store or um, yeah, reading, reading a book or going in to get a service and they're not speaking your language? Like, how could you even start the process, right? And so I think it's important that nonprofit organizations definitely take the time to um, create bilingual uh, materials, if not uh, Spanish language materials. And yes, there are different dialects, um, depending on where you're from. I think um, from my understanding that the Mexican um, uh, Spanish is, is more conversational. And so that's what's utilized. And, and yes, Google Translate doesn't always do the best job. So I think, you know, investing time, uh, um, money and effort to really, um, you know, develop these materials will go a long way um, before even starting to reach um, the community. 
Right. I think it's really important to know. I mean, like, for example, you know, being from Chicago, um, you have a, a different um, linguistic base than maybe somebody in Southern California, certainly yes. even people in the border communities of Texas. They have different types of Spanish, you know, the Caribbean influence, mm -hmm. Mexican influence, Central, South American, Spanish. I mean, yeah, you have to really be thoughtful about this because I was equated to the difference between those of us in our own country who, you know, Jarrett's from the South, you might have people that are speaking English from Great Britain, from the Eastern coast, the Western coast. It's different. It is not one size fits all. So I love that you so, um, address this. And I have a question. Okay. Yeah. So for those individuals in the sector that are like, mm -hmm. Almeras, this is wonderful, but where the heck do I get started? Like, how do I know the language right. um, and really that, that first spoken language that our audience speaks? Now I am thinking, and I've never really been a program manager or, mm -hmm. or solely in the program side. Is this a wonderful opportunity to maybe go back to your onboarding or your intake documents and make sure that it includes those questions? Yes, um, I also think that it's a, it's, it's, if a nonprofit doesn't know where to start, I think it's an important to like maybe do a survey of the community to figure out um, what's in, what's important for them in terms of um, how they want information to be communicated to them. Um, I know that it's not easy, but also like even um, a lot of organizations use uh, consulting services or translation services to help with that. Um, so those are kind of some ways that um, a nonprofit can actually, you know, start to um, sort of look at how how to create these materials um, internally. And then, yeah, well, starting thinking, with the intake documents would be a good one. Yeah, the intake and even those surveys need to be done in those proper languages, you know, English. But then knowing our community demographics, I think, is really important. And those of us, you know, in the sector, we should know our community demographic, but then mm -hmm. to really, you know, assess our, our uh, recipient demographic even further to know exactly, okay, if we are making multilingual uh, materials, programs, and services, what are those top languages that are most frequently spoken? And, mm -hmm. um, and to know, okay, let's provide what's needed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank it's you so, for that. I agree. It seems like such a basic thing, but wow, it does not translate, no pun intended, um, enough. Well, I mean, good job. I know, I know. And it's <laughs> only Monday. I know you're here all week. <laughs> okay. Now getting back in seriously, outreach strategies. Talk to us about that because it seems to me um, you have to back up to your point mm -hmm. and know who the market is, right? Yes. So um, talk to us about that. Yes. So um, with organizations trying to reach out to the Latinx community, as we talked about, like Spanish language materials are, are really key and important to make sure that you have that um, on hand when um, uh, looking to outreach to the community, um, but also like developing innovative strategies to figure out where, where are places and spaces that the Latino community um, gathers? Is it, um, you know, the food pantry, as you mentioned, Jarrett? Is it, um, you know, the laundry mats? Is it uh, grocery store, local grocery stores? Um, and then really, you know, shaping up uh, strategies where you can, you know, go out and maybe canvas, like distributing flyers in Spanish about the programs and services, maybe doing table setups. Um, and then, uh, you know, looking at what partners within um, the community serve the Latino community that also resonates with um, your organization, organization's missions where you can like partner up and really serve um, the these individuals uh, collectively versus um, individually. And so, um, you know, really looking at, at, at that will, will help to be able to, you know, go out and uh, connect with the, the Latinx community. Yeah, I like that. I'm thinking of that amazing leader Jarrett, that we had from San Diego, that was the Chicano Federation. Yeah. And uh, these were some of the things that she said, kind of subtly, you know, like, look for those groups that are already doing things, but can't do everything. Yes. Can't do everything, but, you know, we'll, we'll work, you know, unidos, we'll work together, but you got to do some research beforehand. Yeah. That collaboration is, is so critical, so imperative. And, you know, and to identify who are the organizations maybe that are doing such a great job. 
anytime I'm coaching my clients, the first and for, first and foremost thing I ask is who is doing this or who is doing something similar to this? And it doesn't need to be in our backyard. I am literally talking in the world. Where have you benchmarked something like this happening? And what have you found in your research, right? First of all, they're like, well, that's a good question. I haven't researched that, which then is their first homework, right? <laughs> okay, now go, go research that. And then secondarily, what are they doing that's working? And what are some things that have still opportunity for improvement? Um, and so really finding these um, strategic partnerships or resources even, I think is, is pretty imperative. Yes. And I also, um, one thing that I'm noticing that a lot of nonprofit organizations are starting to invest um, money in is um, having an actual community like outreach or community engagement department, um, where there's a specific staff person that goes out into the community and is able to, you know, attend these events, um, do these outreach uh, tables, um, connect with these partners, um, help with the marketing team to, you know, post um, about the programs and services on Spanish language media. And so I think I think it's really key to have someone that's really dedicated to doing this work because it will help in the long run with being able to serve uh, that community. And um, in Chicago, actually, and I don't know if it's been um, done in other um, states, we've been utilizing sort of a kind of a community health um, worker model in which we um, really employ people from the community who know the community to go out and be able to outreach to the individuals that. that you're trying to serve. Yeah, and it's perfect because, you know, what what better person to go out and connect with the Latino community than someone who is Latino themselves or is from the community that you're trying to serve. So, I mean, there's there's really different ways to kind of look at it um, and to really employ it um, at a I, nonprofit I, level. I love that. One of their own, I'm going to share, I was working with a food bank and we did a really large national um for a lack of being a little vague here, we did a really large national study. <laughs> and so um, here in Arizona, border state, right? It, it becomes very political when it comes to sharing information, especially when it comes to, you know, household information, citizenship, those kind of questions. And for me to show up in the community was like red flag. You know, I really, I, I was not able to receive the data, the metrics that I was sent to receive which made it really critical, right, for the organization to invest in that outreach and yes. to really provide the opportunity of um, having someone that is a little bit more near peer, um, as opposed to sending solo Weta in, which just did not go over <laughs> well. <laughs> and I don't blame anyone for that, you know, um, but it was just a learning opportunity, which goes back, Julia, it's like, so, so often we think that it is just basic knowledge. You know, this is common sense, but it's not, it's really not. And I think too, as a nonprofit sector, you know, we're always rubbing those pennies together and it's, it's kind of that fear of the investment for the financial, um, component. Yeah. Exactly. You know, we've had some questions come in and I'm going to push those more towards the end. Okay. Um, so, so stick with us. I want to get on to this, um, this piece, and it kind of dovetails to what Jarrett just said, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can, we use the word a lot of times, rubia, you know, why would you bring in a rubia para, for <laughs> a, a community where it doesn't work? And yeah. so hiring bilingual, but I liked what you had to say here, bicultural mm -hmm. staff, because we see this a lot throughout the border states where Jarrett and I live. We have different types of language. We have different, physically different looking people. They're not just all under the umbrella of Latinx. I mean, it's, it's so, it's such an interesting thing. And yet I'm wondering how you suggest we do this without appearing to be biased or even outwardly racist or prejudiced. Um, so some some ways that I've seen um, nonprofit organizations do this um, really well is um, if they're looking to expand um, their uh, employee base to be uh, more bicultural, bilingual, um, is posting it on the job posting, right? So you can you can make that a requirement. Uh, bilingual preferred, you know, familiarity with the Latino Latinx or Latino community, um, and that's. That's not wrong to do that, right? Um, and then also um, really connecting with um, uh, career career type organizations that 
um, work with bilingual staff in order to um, promote these opportunities and hire them. Um, and when you do that, it doesn't necessarily seem like, you know, there's any bias. It's more like you're, you're being intentional about trying to go after individuals that you think will be, you know, beneficial to your mission and to reaching out to the Latinx community. And I think there, there's definitely nothing wrong with it. I mean, I, um, I'm Hispanic and I, and I love applying for um, positions where I know that my Spanish language um, is needed and that my familiarity with the background is needed. I, I feel perfectly fine. And I love the fact that like, I can, I can have more leverage um, in terms of a job positions um, within the nonprofit sector because they need they need people like myself um, to help out so yeah yeah wow. amazing okay now this is really again we could spend an, 100 hours just on this <laughs> action item alone but eliminating barriers to service mm -hmm. what does that look like because we've talked about language <laughs> what are some of these other barriers so um, it would depend on the actual nonprofit. So what I've seen, um, it, it, you know, some nonprofits do is that they'll develop these programs and services and try to reach out to the Latin, Latinx community. Um, and they don't have a greater understanding of what are some of the barriers for them to be able to participate. Um, the Latinx community has a lot of, you know, fear with um, the state and federal government. And so if you're creating these programs that have like long intake um, uh, processes and uh, very sensitive questions, you know, obviously for like the undocumented community. Um, like that the one be, I was a part of. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that could be, that could be a bit, that, that definitely is a barrier. That's kind of, you know, sometimes it's a turnoff for, um, you know, the Latinx community, or if there's, um, you know, if they don't have access to transportation or childcare. So I think it depends on the nonprofit, the type of programs and services that they're offering, um, and the, you know, their individual Latinx communities needs. Um, and so I think it goes back to that main point that we were talking about with when you're trying to build trust, really listening to the needs of the community before developing the programs and services, developing those Spanish language materials so that you can be able to position yourself, um, you know, at a point where you can, you know, reach out to them. And then looking at spaces and places where you can um, be able to, uh, you know, recruit individuals within your program and services, but then again, making sure that you have um, the resources in place to, um, to serve the community and not, um, allow them to, to have any issues with um, applying for your programs or services. Let me ask you, this is, might seem like a super weird question, but do you yeah. feel in the um, Latinx community that there is a difference between working with the male and the female population? Like decisions that might come more on the, the male side of the family or the hierarchy, or is that just old school thinking? No, I, I I do think that that's something that um, is still is still done till this day. Um, I've worked with um, families where I have to wait for um, the uh, the you know maybe it's the mother or um, the female figure within the um, household to go back and speak to um, the male in the household to make sure that it's it's okay to move forward. Um, and I think that's what I was trying to insinuate when we were talking about like the communication and building trust that it's not just addressing the individual um, you know. Uh, that you're trying to, you know, work with, but also like the family structure as a, as a whole. And that's key because you can't move ahead if they're not comfortable, um, if they're not ready, or if they need to be able to make this decision with um, the patriarch of the family. So. Wow. Okay. Well, I am mortified to say we don't have much time, but I, cause I can talk to you forever yeah. in a day. This is like my jam. I love this discussion um, because I see it in my community. I see it in my family. I see it in the, the history and the geopolitics of my, you know, of the region. So I want to get to this question. It came in from uh, Lauren and I, it's a very, very interesting. It says, sorry to ask this basic question, but in California, people often use the term Hispanic more than Latinx. Mm -hmm. Can Al, can Al, can Al God, I didn't say that right. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> no, it's not fine. No, it's not fine. <laughs> Um, can Al Neris share, share her insight about this kind of trend and what is the more appropriate terminology? I would say that both are um, 
acceptable. I think Latinx tends to um, en encompass or Latino encompasses people from Latin America. Hispanic is more just kind of like the general population. You could be from anywhere like the, the Caribbean, South America. So I think it, it really, you know, depends on your organization, what kind of language you want to use. Um, but I don't think either one is, 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 um, you can't go wrong is what I'm saying okay. with using, yeah, with so using Latinx or Hispanic. So it doesn't yeah. seem to an older population too aggressive or too um, modern to use the word Latinx? Yes, um, because that's something that's a sort of a new term um, that we're, we've been hearing um, lately. Um, so it, again, really depends on like the audience and, and who you're trying to target. But um, Hispanic and Latinx, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's, there's sort of any, any difference within, within those two um, uh, terms, if you decided to, to go with either one. Of them. What a great opportunity then to ask your constituency base or your audience, you know, really, <laughs> what is the term you prefer? Just like yes. we're doing with pronouns, you know, it's really a great time to ask and really hear directly from those individuals uh, that you serve and those recipients of your program. I wouldn't know either, you know, and I, and I tell everyone that surrounds me and that, and that, you know, I surround back is educate me, please educate me. I have like an open door policy that I, just as we said with you, please correct us if we mispronounce your name, because out of respect, we certainly want to respect uh, you, your culture, your namesake and, and whatnot. Um, Julia, I agree. This has been phenomenal. We are so appreciative Amazing. that you um, came in to, to share your area of expertise with us. Please do check out Alneres Benegas. I work nonprofit at gmail.com. Check her out on Instagram too. Super cool um, page profile. I don't know what it's called, but anyway, um, really amazing to have you on. I knew that when you and I had our brief, very brief phone <laughs> conversation about having you on to be a guest on the show, I just knew that you were going to, you know, blow our minds and provide so many fantastic nuggets of information. So uh, genuinely from the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming on and for all that you do in our community. Uh, I know you are in the Chicago neighborhoods and yeah. uh, again, just as a, a global citizen, thank you for being part of the global world and all of the good work that you continue to do. I'm just grateful to have you on. Thank you. And you're, yeah, thank you guys for, for having me. This has been a pleasure um, and I look forward to next time. Absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would really love to um, get you on and maybe have you address, and Jared and I have been talking about this with a lot of our guests, but mm -hmm. having you address the concept of um, asking, querying, surveying, engaging yes. your populations to oh, get okay. some better ideas, because this is really you know, Jared mentioned this, we need to be asking more. We can't be telling, we need to be asking. And so how do we, how do, we do that? Um, certainly it's a, it's a new dawn in how we can engage our constituencies. Hey, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. You've been joined today by Jared Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, also known as the birthday girl. Yes, <laughs> where's my crown? <laughs> you know, what the heck? Oh man, man. Okay, well, you're going to be um, off for a few days. Enjoying. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it's really fun. And I'd love to share. Um, sure. As you all know, Winspire was a wonderful presenting sponsor of ours. And I am able to take um, advantage of their partnership. And so I will be experiencing one of the gala packages that Winspire offers. And uh, yes, I'm taking my son and we are going to Hawaii, um, Honolulu for the week to celebrate my birthday. And i um, just so grateful for the opportunity and also to practice self-care. I'm loving that. I can't wait to find out how it all goes down. And um, yeah, to find out what that experience is, um, having purchased a trip from a gala, because this is a big part of uh, the fundraising circuit, you know, and um, so yeah, that's going to be fun. Again, we want to thank our sponsors. Without you, we would not be here. I want to mention for those of you who get our Sunday um, e-blast that, that talks about who's coming forward on the week, Bloomerang is doing a really interesting survey about tech. And so if you have a chance, check that out. Five minutes. 
Oh, if it, if you, yeah, if even, but they want to know kind of like your fear, your hesitancy. They're not trying to sell you anything. It's just strictly like what's cooking. And so check that out again, fundraising events, TV, one of our newest programs um, is actually a, a different show. Check us out there. It's a lot of fun. Whew. Okay. Great way to start the week. Yes. We, We'll be missing you, Miss Jarrett, but we will be with you on that beach in spirit. Well, I look forward to coming back. Save my seat. Okay, we will. As we like to say at the end of every episode, stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody.